In a crime-ridden neighborhood deep in the heart of Brazil, a young woman named Florida Lee rose up to become a singer, a wealthy pastor of six mega churches, and a politician, but not before becoming a mother to 55 children. From preaching on the streets to commanding audiences with celebrities and high-powered politicians, Brazil's superstar told a story of love and redemption and promised to serve the people. She posted daily to her 1 million Instagram followers that she was chosen by God. But behind the scenes of this saintly woman was a life of scandal, corruption, strange love affairs, and a murder investigation. This is the story of how an evangelical empire of a powerful woman, once hailed as the mother of the nation, came crumbling down. Before we begin, I want to thank Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. I am a big fan of designer perfumes, but not a fan of designer prices. Gardenia is one of my favorite fragrance notes, and I love to smell good, because who doesn't? Scentbird is reimagining everything about how people discover, shop for, purchase, and even experience fragrances. Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every single month for just $17. One of my favorite things about Scentbird is that each month you get to pick what you want to receive so there are no surprises. In my favorite month of October, I received from Scentbird Burberry's Brit Sheer, Confessions of a Rebel's Bitch Please, and Versace's Bright Crystal Absolute. Without a doubt, Confessions of a Rebel was my absolute favorite. It's a unisex fragrance, and I loved the notes of jasmine and sandalwood in it. Scentbird has perfumes, colognes, and a lot of unisex options too. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30-day supply so you can try out the fragrances before you decide to commit to a full-size bottle. A bottle that can cost over $150, and some are even three to $500. Scentbird has over 600 brands to choose from, including Prada, Gucci, Versace, as well as indie labels like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of a Rebel. Scentbird's packaging is also sleek and travel-friendly. I personally love receiving new scents each month and getting to play around with some I may have never tried if it wasn't for Scentbird. Use my coupon code for 55% off from Scentbird, and it's available in the U.S. and Canada. Thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. I am a big fan of this product and I truly appreciate the support. Be sure to check out the links below. Florida Lee dos Santos de Sousa was born February 5th, 1961 in Brazil. Her father was an artist and musician while her mother ran a daycare looking after children from the community in their home. But this was no ordinary middle-class upbringing. The family lived in one of the largest favelas in Rio de Janeiro. If you've ever watched a movie set in Rio and marveled at the bright colors of the haphazard buildings built into the towering foothills, those are the favelas. While from afar they may look exotic, to those living within them, they are anything but. The favelas are where the poorest call home. Many of the buildings are precariously built on foundations first laid in the 1940s. With no maintenance and years of illegal construction, the buildings are prone to collapse. Given that safe drinking water and effective sewerage systems are in short supply, the residents of the favelas face rampant infections and very poor sanitation. Despite these issues, more than 11 million citizens of Brazil call a favela home. While Florida Lee was growing up, many residents of her favela struggled to find work and lived on mere dollars a day. Still, the community was tight-knit and families supported each other as best they could. Many neighborhoods formed residents' associations, and these organizations gave residents a forum to raise issues which would then be taken up with local governments in the hopes of improving conditions for those who lived there. While the formation of these groups did manage to result in medical centers being established, they were quickly overrun when illegal substances began to permeate the favelas in the 1960s. 
At that time, Brazil was experiencing a period of deep political unrest. With crime on the rise and a seemingly unstoppable flow of illegal substances throughout the community, the favelas had become hubs for criminal activities. Like many others, Flor de Lis' family was caught right in the middle. It was around this time that missionaries and those spreading a message of hope through religion began to visit the favelas more frequently. In this place of deep instability and scarcity, the Pentecostal preachers found a keen audience willing to believe in anything that promised an escape from their daily challenges. Before long, Mr. and Mrs. Dos Santos converted and their family joined a Pentecostal church known globally as Assembly of God, one of the biggest Pentecostal organizations in the world. The family took their faith seriously, and Florida Lee's father began holding prayer groups in their home. He made it his mission to share the word of Pentecostalism with anyone he met. The Pentecostal faith is a form of charismatic Christianity. Pentecostals believe a person can be medically healed by faith alone, and that humans who have been baptized with what Christians call the Holy Spirit can receive supernatural gifts such as the ability to heal someone else. And don't forget speaking in tongues. It's one more gift Pentecostals believe they receive from their God's Holy Spirit. Pentecostals believe once you have been baptized and this Holy Spirit resides within you, you can go out into the world and use this miraculous power to heal others, speak prophecy over another person, and convert anyone you come in contact with. As a child, Florida Lee believed she witnessed this power time and time again when she attended church services with her parents. During these church services, she watched on as the congregation enthusiastically sang, danced, and spoke in tongues, sometimes for hours at a time. Florida Lee loved to sing and she was happy to join in. She was a gifted singer and she was regularly invited to the front of the church to lead worship. As she reached her early teen years, Florida Lee followed in her father's footsteps and began to host prayer groups of her own. But she wasn't going to settle for preaching just to the people she already knew. Florida Lee wanted to save as many people as she could. Even from those early years, Florida Lee believed she was destined for more, much more, and this sense of self-importance would become a recurring theme throughout her life. Driven by her higher purpose, Florida Lee took to evangelizing on the streets of the favelas. Despite her young age and diminutive stature, Florida Lee ventured deep into the dark underbelly of the criminal enterprises being run in the local area. She would confidently approach known criminals and preach to them of their potential for redemption and deliverance through her God. And somehow, these people listened to her. Her passionate words convinced even hardened criminals to convert to the church and ultimately to Florida Lee herself. At the age of 14, Florida Lee's faith was challenged in the most brutal way when her father and brother died in a car accident. Florida Lee and her mother were left alone, trying to find a way forward. But far from dissuading her from her beliefs, the deaths seemed to solidify Florida Lee's spirituality. She begged her mother to help her, and together they secured the lease on a small shop front where they began hosting sermons for the believers Florida Lee had converted from the streets. Florida Lee was a passionate leader. Many found her voice beautiful. It was a soothing balm for the damaged souls who attended her sermons. Florida Lee's following quickly grew, as did her sense of self. While she was wholly dedicated to her church, Florida Lee also had to make ends meet. She followed in her mother's footsteps and began working as a kindergarten teacher, once again surrounded by children as she had been all her life. In her early 20s, she married a man, though not much is known about him, and together they had three children. But by the time Florida Lee was 30, the husband was no longer around and Florida Lee was raising the children on her own. During the day, she ran the daycare with her mom and looked after the children, and on weekends, she continued to minister to her congregation. By then, her sermons focused heavily on herself and the visions she claimed were given to her by her God. Due to the rising crime in Rio's favelas, 
Florida Lee once again felt compelled to act. She formed a group of disciples who followed her into the dark alleyways after midnight, hoping to bring lost teenagers and criminals into the light. Surprisingly, her tactics continued to work. Once again, she disarmed hardened criminals with her charisma and promises of redemption. Florida Lee then shared her exploits with her congregation as a means to further exalt herself. She told them how one night in those dark alleys, she came face to face with one of the favela's most notorious dealers. The man was with a group of his armed followers, and they quickly surrounded Florida Lee as she approached. Despite being at the mercy of a group of these dangerous men but wanting to pass, Florida Lee told them, quote, If my God wants to, he will turn you into a leper right now. Your nose will fall off and there is nothing you can do. End quote. In response to her proclamation, the men backed down and let her pass. It was an inspiring story and did the trick to draw more disciples into her orbit. By then, there were whispers of Florida Lee being a prophet or saint sent directly to Rio to save those who had been abandoned by society. Florida Lee never denied the rumors of her saintliness. And what does any good saint do when surrounded by such poverty and despair? They save the children. Florida Lee opened her home to the children of the favelas and began to adopt them left and right. There was just one problem with her saintly endeavor. The kids she brought into her home weren't abandoned or homeless, or even runaways. In fact, she let any child who wanted to come to her house stay. She had no rules, no boundaries, and the adoptions weren't anything close to formal. Word got around with the other children about how good things were at Florida Lee's place. And as a result, many kids simply disappeared from their families, taking up residence at her home. But these details were a mere distraction to the point, according to Florida Lee. To outsiders and her congregation, she was a savior who was uplifting children from their dysfunctional environment and providing stability and opportunities they would have never had otherwise. They truly believed she was empowered by the authority of her God and therefore she could do whatever she was led to do in his name. But it's what came next which should have truly disturbed Florida Lee's devoted followers. By the time Florida Lee opened her doors to the neighborhood children, she was in her early 30s. The children that occupied her home ranged from middle school age to teenagers. Anderson Do Carmo was 15 years old when he crossed paths with Florida Lee. Florida Lee adopted Anderson when he was 15 years old in 1992. And not long after moving into her home, he began to date her daughter, Simone. But it didn't take long for the other children to realize Anderson was Florida Lee's favorite. He seemed to get special attention right from the beginning. Over the coming years, Florida Lee and the young man grew closer. Whatever the time frame for the romance, by the time Anderson was 19 years old, the two were married, their 16-year age gap being of little consequence to either of them. Florida Lee denied grooming her adopted son and her daughter's ex-boyfriend and swore to everyone that nothing happened with Anderson until he was 18 years old. But rather than slow things down for Florida Lee, the marriage appeared to ramp things up. She already had five adopted children and her own three biological children living with her and her husband permanently. But after preaching at the Rio Central train station and hearing about a group of children who are impacted by a recent attack, Florida Lee saw yet another opportunity to advance her saintly reputation. The Rio Central train station is a hub for both transport and homeless Brazilians pushed out of even the favelas by overcrowding. In February of 1994, Florida Lee was giving her regular sermon about salvation through Christ when she was approached by a woman who had a confession to make. The woman had just abandoned her newborn baby in a vacant lot and begged Florida Lee to find the baby and adopt her. Florida Lee agreed, and when they found the infant just where the mother had left her, she returned home with the newborn in her arms. Days later, that same woman showed up at Florida Lee's home, and alongside her were more children who needed saving, 37 to be exact, including 14 infants. 
The woman told her that the children were all victims of a recent attack where corrupt officers killed their parents and caregivers, leaving them with no means of survival. Florida Lee already had eight children, and she and her husband lived in a two-bedroom apartment. Florida Lee and Anderson agreed to take them in. There can surely be nothing more glorifying than saving so many traumatized children from the streets of Rio where they could starve, be killed, or lost to violence. Florida Lee told her congregation, quote, One morning, I woke up to a great uproar in my house. When my husband and I opened the door, we were astounded. There were 37 kids and teenagers fleeing a killing at the Central de Brazil. That is how my story of adoption started, end quote. She declared her good deeds far and wide, and within weeks, it paid off. Local and international media picked up her story, and Florida Lee shot from local preacher to international saintly sensation. Every day, Florida Lee was fielding calls from the media wanting to interview her about their incredible story. Florida Lee opened her door to all of them, and it's what these journalists would uncover which would reveal a disturbing dark side to the righteous preacher. Bit by bit, interview by interview, it became clear to reporters that Florida Lee did not have the means to support so many children. While her reputation afforded her some status in the favela, it didn't pay the bills. So how was she feeding so many mouths? The children ate what they found. She would send the children out scavenging on the streets of Rio, digging through dumpsters behind restaurants and in more affluent areas. What they found in dumpsters was theirs to eat. And then there was the disturbing fact that no formal adoption of any of the children had ever taken place. When these facts were published, alarm bells went off with city officials and child protection workers. A judge accused Florida Lee of harboring underage children and demanded that she show up for a hearing in court. Rather than face the consequences of her actions, Florida Lee took an altogether different approach. She rounded up all the children on a bus and went into hiding, though she chose a location just 25 minutes away from the favela she left. When she arrived, she was questioned by local gang members who demanded she tell them why she was there with so many children. This was their turf, and they wanted answers. Using the same charisma and way with words that converted so many criminals before, she told the men her story, and they were moved. So much, in fact, that these gang members ended up collaborating with the president of the community association to find accommodation where she could go into hiding with all the children. But hiding did little to lessen the storm that was rising against Florida Lee. Her reputation was in tatters with talk of her being arrested and put on trial for child abduction. She was left with little choice but to make an appearance in the hopes of spinning the narrative in her favor. Florida Lee announced that she would hold a press conference to share her side of the story. As she had predicted, cameras and news stations fought for a spot to hear what she had to say. She took her spot on the podium while questions were shouted at her and confidently announced that she was due to meet with a person from the United Nations and face the judge who had accused her of harboring underage children and demanded her arrest. Her declaration seemed to appease the media, especially when she followed through on her vow. Then something bizarre happened. Seeing the media's support of Florida Lee, the officials who formerly decried her actions and worried about the children who hadn't been officially adopted turned around and began to support her. Florida Lee was hailed as a hero for saving so many children, and supporters came forward to find an organization which would assist her to legally adopt all the children. After having adopted a few more by this point, Florida Lee would now be called mother by 55 children to be exact. The praise and support for Florida Lee continued and two businessmen provided a fully furnished home on the western side of Rio where she could live with all the children. It had a large garage that Florida Lee and Anderson decided to turn into a new church. Anderson led the sermons while Florida Lee sang, Tithing was also demanded, as Pentecostal beliefs state members must tithe regularly in order to access the gates of heaven. Hosting private services became quite lucrative for the couple. Indeed, the negative publicity had become an exceedingly positive experience for the family. With money flowing in from the tithes of members, 
They saved enough to build their own church in an abandoned bus depot she named City of Fire. Off the back of Florida Lee's reputation, the new congregation was an instant success with more than 5,000 people attending her weekly sermon. Florida Lee was the star of the show. While Anderson's sermons were heartfelt and stirring, it was Florida Lee's singing which truly moved the hearts and wallets of her followers. But the tithe money wasn't enough. Florida Lee decided to open a gift shop in the front of her church where one could purchase mugs with her face on them that included inspirational quotes from her music. But Florida Lee wanted to dream bigger. She felt success was her destiny, and in 1998, she released her first studio album titled Florida Lee. While the album failed to achieve many sales, it did establish Florida Lee as a legitimate celebrity and deflected attention away from her questionable background. In 2002, the host of Planet Susha asked Florida Lee to appear on her show for a Mother's Day special. Planet Susha was one of Brazil's most popular TV talk shows with the host, Susha, holding a similar rank of celebrity to the likes of Oprah Winfrey and Ellen DeGeneres. Florida Lee attended the taping with many of her children in tow. Millions watched as Susha gushed that, quote, Florida Lee is a real mom, a special mom. Susha then bestowed upon Florida Lee a title by which she would come to be known for many more years. Susha announced Florida Lee was the mother of the nation. The show's appearance was a turning point for Florida Lee. She was approached by numerous television shows, politicians, and wealthy benefactors. They all wanted to be seen alongside the mother of the nation. One of these superfans was a renowned filmmaker. And after visiting the favelas with Florida Lee and, of course, taking thousands of well-timed shots of the people she humbly helped on the way, he decided Florida Lee needed a platform of her own. He set about producing a biographical film about Florida Lee and the impact she had on the favelas and her many adopted children. But the film wasn't just about Florida Lee. Florida Lee would star in the film as herself. The remainder of the cast were famous soap opera stars who offered to forego payment and in turn have the proceeds dedicated to Florida Lee and her children. The movie was titled Florida Lee, Just One Word is Enough to Make a Change and was released in 2009 at Rio's International Film Festival. Florida Lee was now a movie star. She laughed at the spotlight and attended the red carpet premiere with her young husband on her arm. But just like with her album, Florida Lee's reputation didn't equal sales, and the film was labeled a flop. All was not lost, though, as the film further solidified her profile, and months later she signed with a recording agency. Over the next decade, she released five albums filled with songs of redemption and praise. These albums were much more successful than her first release, and her songs are still sung in many of Brazil's Pentecostal churches to this day. As Florida Lee's star continued to rise, she opened eight more branches of her church, increasing tithing income exponentially, and opened the door to a whole new horde of people she could sell her merchandise to. As the pastors of nine megachurches, life was good for Florida Lee and Anderson. They were making $20,000 per month through tithing and her various income streams, far exceeding the average Brazilian wage of just $500 a month. The girl from the favelas was wearing Chanel handbags, flying business class, and living in a gated community. But the life of Florida Lee would take such an unhinged and disastrous turn that many would say it was too bizarre to be real. Back in 2004, before the movie about her life was released, Florida Lee had unsuccessfully run for city council. Now with her fame well established, she was ready to try again. In 2016, she ran for mayor in a southwestern city of Rio de Janeiro and once again failed to gain enough votes to secure the win. But Florida Lee figured, forget local government, she would try for a higher position. She set her sights on central government and in 2018, put her name forward for the Chamber of Deputies representing Rio de Janeiro. One could consider this position equivalent to being a governor in the United States. Florida Lee campaigned hard. 
Anderson and Florida Lee were making up to four appearances a day in the lead-up to the election, and this time her reputation paid off. Four months later, Florida Lee won the February 2019 election in a landslide victory and was sworn into office. At the time, she declared, quote, I was over the moon, happy, happy, happy. I'd achieved things I could never have dreamed of. God went so far beyond my dreams, so very far, end quote. Florida Lee was now a singer, preacher, and politician. As in everything she did, Florida Lee soared in politics. She got to fly in private planes, speak on important legislation, and like many evangelicals in Brazil, was a proud supporter of then-President Bolsonaro. She captioned her Instagram post with how proud she was to help crack down on crime in Brazil and rampant government corruption. But this success would be short-lived. Forget adopting 55 children, being a singing sensation, pastoring a megachurch, and her political success. Florida Lee was about to leave her biggest mark on Brazil yet. June 15th of 2019 began like any other day for Florida Lee and Anderson. By then, Florida Lee was 58 years old and her husband was 42. People had always considered them an attractive couple, and they were long adored for their perfect marriage filled with so many children, considerable success, and plenty of money. But behind closed doors, things were not as harmonious as they appeared. For years, Anderson had been Florida Lee's manager, co-pastor, and co-parent. Over that time, he had come to find success in his own right and was revered as a powerful pastor capable of converting people after just one sermon. But some people believed that with his success came a swelling ego. Anderson loved the limelight as much as Florida Lee, maybe even more. After her political appointment, he had taken to attending all of her meetings and often speaking on her behalf, even when it was about the work which she had been elected to do. Anderson also controlled how their church was run, how the children were parented, and much to Florida Lee's dismay, he controlled the family's finances. Florida Lee was growing increasingly dissatisfied with having to ask for permission to spend the money she earned, especially when it came to splurging on certain luxuries for herself Anderson seemed to have a problem with. But separation or divorce was off the table. After all, Florida Lee was a devoutly religious woman and divorce is never a good look for a Pentecostal. She wasn't about to have a scandal destroy her hard-earned reputation. She decided that she alone was responsible for the position she found herself in, and she would be the one to get herself out. Deciding that they needed to do something to reignite the spark between them, Florida Lee suggested a walk down the Copacabana beach boardwalk one night with Anderson. It worked. After a leisurely stroll at 2 a.m. and grabbing a bite to eat from a local vendor, Florida Lee and Anderson headed towards the car. The events of the night had the desired effect, and these two conservative pastors ended up having sex on the hood of their car, right there in the car park at the end of the beach. After crying out the name of God, but not through prayer, they put themselves back together and began their drive home, just a few miles away. When later recalling the events of that night, Florida Lee said two angry motorbikers began tailgating them. Anderson was driving and stepped on the gas in an attempt to ditch the angry men. It worked, and the couple safely pulled into their driveway. Florida Lee immediately headed inside to check on the children, while Anderson stayed in the car for another minute to check his email. Florida Lee hadn't been inside very long, when suddenly, the silence of the night was shattered by a weapon fired multiple times right outside their home. Florida Lee tried to rush outside to see what happened, but one of her children stopped her from going any further. They told her she wouldn't want to see. While parked in the driveway, Anderson had been shot 30 times while still in the driver's seat, with most of the wounds in his groin area. Two of their sons rushed him to the hospital, but it was too late. Anderson was declared dead on arrival. By the next morning, Anderson's attack made headline news. The Rio Times declared, husband of Brazilian federal deputy assassinated. It was clear to everyone involved that Anderson had been the target of a political attack. The perpetrators likely wanted Florida Lee, but had settled for her husband when she miraculously escaped. Distraught, 
Florida Lee held an all-night vigil at one of her churches in commemoration of her husband and sobbed uncontrollably, almost fainting at one point. Her husband of 21 years was gone, and Florida Lee was devastated. Meanwhile, police were going through hours of CCTV footage from the cameras surrounding the gated community and the roads leading up to the couple's home. It wasn't long before they realized something was missing. There were no motorbike riders, no angry tailgaters, and no one had followed the couple into the street that night. The couple's home also had cameras, and while they were strangely pointed away from the house, they did record comings and goings on the street outside. Just 15 minutes before Anderson was attacked, the cameras captured an Uber pull-up outside. One of the couple's children appeared to run inside the house, then returned to the Uber and sped off. Investigators couldn't determine whether this occurrence was related to Anderson's death, and it was clear that something was not adding up with footage of that night not matching Florida Lee's story. So investigators turned their attention to the occupants of the house, all 56 of them. Background checks were run on the children, all of whom were then in their teens or 20s now. While you might expect that many of the kids who Florida Lee rescued from the streets had police records, Many of their offenses were as recent as just a few months before Anderson's attack, putting her assertions of running a God-fearing household in question. Investigators wanted to speak to the young man from the footage captured just before Anderson's murder. His name was Lucas, and he was an 18-year-old Florida Lee had adopted as a teenager. His background check revealed he had an outstanding warrant for dealing illegal substances. When officers questioned him about the early morning Uber drop-in, Lucas surprisingly admitted he was dealing at the time and wanted to hide his stash at home before he headed to a nightclub. The officers sensed that Lucas had more to say, and they continued to press him about his dealing and any other criminal activity he might be involved in. Under pressure, Lucas began to share more about the lead-up to that night. Lucas revealed that a week before the murder, he visited a nearby favela to purchase a weapon, but it wasn't for him. It was a favor to Flavio, who was one of Florida Lee's biological sons. Lucas pointed the finger at Flavio as the attacker in their father's death. A warrant for Flavio was issued, and just 36 hours after the attack, Flavio was arrested at Anderson's funeral. Once in custody, Flavio confessed to his part, but the lead investigator suspected there was more to the story than Flavio was willing or able to share, and he would be right. One by one, all 55 children were interviewed about what happened that night. What the children revealed would blow the case wide open and reveal the truly dark side of the mother of the nation. This was no robbery gone wrong. While Florida Lee always presented herself as a maternal person, The children recalled their experience with her as anything but warm and loving. They were organized into a hierarchy where new children were assigned to older children to be taken care of. Florida Lee had very little to do with them. There was no hugging or comforting, no kisses and cuddles. Florida Lee told them that she had died and been reincarnated as an angel and that they were all sent by God to protect her. In other words, she surrounded herself with children as bodyguards and protection from the judgment and rules of the society around them. Many of the children were given new biblical names, and she commanded them to view her as an idol. Remember in the beginning of the story how some of the children had families and they weren't really homeless or abandoned? Florida Lee told those children they didn't need their biological families anymore. When desperate mothers rang to talk to their children and encouraged them to return home, Florida Lee cut them off and denied the children any contact. The children were required to scavenge for their own food, and the older ones were sent to work, with their earnings being given to Anderson and Florida Lee. But it wasn't only her parenting which was lacking. On her social media accounts, she praised herself for rescuing children and being a servant to the people. She sang and smiled for the cameras and dressed to impress. But behind the scenes, this crooked pastor implemented strange spiritual practices with her family. She forced the children into prayer sessions that lasted for days, and when a child misbehaved, they could be locked in a room for 21 days to be cleansed, with the door only opening for the child to be given food. 
When questioned about why these rituals weren't in the Bible, Florida Lee would say she had been told about them on a visit by God. But all of that was just a precursor to the main event, Anderson's attack. The 55 children all held different pieces of the puzzle, and through their interviews, the truth about the weeks and months leading up to that night was revealed. As far back as a year before, several of the children had been involved in a plot against Anderson. Initially, they attempted it by poisoning his food with arsenic. Anderson was hospitalized six times, but somehow survived. After that failure, they moved on to the plot of a robbery gone wrong. The police wanted to know why they wanted Anderson gone in the first place. The answer was Florida Lee. The children told the police of how Florida Lee grew increasingly bitter about Anderson's control over her money and time. He was in charge of her schedule, who she met with, and when. Everything she did was on his terms, and he was becoming more and more influential by the year. While Florida Lee initially expected Anderson to support her to achieve her dreams, he had become successful in his own right and was gaining more attention than she was, and Florida Lee wouldn't stand for it. She had worked too hard to get where she was, so she mobilized her child bodyguards to protect her interests. When questioned by the police, Florida Lee denied any involvement in the attack. She told officers that she loved her husband and had no reason to want him gone, saying, quote, To do so would be to destroy myself. After God himself, he was the most important thing in the world to me, end quote. Where she once sought to save the children, now she was ready to blame the children. Florida Lee told the police she suspected her children might want Anderson dead after stumbling across some of their text messages but she innocently thought that once she talked to them and prayed, they would put an end to their plans. However, the children's stories on this were consistent. They recalled many times Florida Lee saying, quote, Anderson is going to die because he is in God's way. When the poisoning didn't work, she told them, if you want to kill him, it will have to be bullets. And there was one more motive. Florida Lee had a new love interest. Another one of her adopted children, of course. His name was Luciano, and he was her new favorite and in a prime position to replace Anderson, who Florida Lee thought had grown too confident for his own good. Within six days of Anderson's death, six more children were arrested. But arresting Florida Lee would be much more challenging. Due to her elected position, she had parliamentary immunity. Media coverage of the case was unrelenting. Revelations about the truth behind Florida Lee's saintly image had turned her followers against her. Six months after Anderson's death, her empire was crumbling. All but one of her churches closed, and fewer than 100 worshipers gathered for her weekly sermons. She made it a point to regularly post on her Instagram and talk about how depressed she was without Anderson. Even posting old photos of them together, declaring her love for him would never die. But things were about to get infinitely worse for Florida Lee. In 2021, Parliament voted to remove her from her elected position. She was therefore stripped of the political immunity which once protected her. The following day, she posted a video to her Instagram where she stated, quote, The day nobody wished for has arrived. I'm being arrested for something I did not do. Pray for me. End quote. She was immediately charged with aggravated murder and taken into custody. In November of 2022, she was tried and found guilty of ordering the murder of her husband's son. She was sentenced to 50 years and 28 days in prison. Flavio was sentenced to 33 years for pulling the trigger and Lucas to 7 years for buying the weapon. Other children involved also received sentences. The revered preacher and politician thought, why divorce when you can kill? Florida Lee believed herself to be invincible, but her pride would be her downfall. This has been the story of Florida Lee dos Santos de Sousa, Brazil's mommy dearest. If you are a fan of learning about scams, cults, and cautionary tales, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you'll be notified when a new documentary comes out. My name is Josie, and thank you so much for watching.
Once again, thank you to Stepbird for sponsoring this video.